everyone. My name is Claire Patton and welcome to Discovering DH with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today I'm interviewing Dr. Sarah Griswold of the History Department and we're going to be talking about her trophy project. Hi Sarah. Hi How Claire. Are you? <laughs> I'm good. All right. How are you? I'm doing well. Why don't you give us a quick overview of your most recent project? Sure. So I'm working with Megan Mackin, who is one of the librarians who specializes in DH at the library. Um, and she's really helped me figure out what, what I had in terms of tools. Um, and so I'm using Trophy, which is a um, basically a, um, a database that you can create um, and uh, upload photographs and then transcribe the um, the photograph document um, and tag them so that they're really sortable to help you keep track of your research and to find themes and connections. Um, and so I'll tell you like what I'm working on actually. So um, I'm a French historian, but I um, have a grandfather who's since passed away, but my, my grandpa was in D-Day and he was in D-Day plus three and he was a dentist. Um, I also happen to have a father who's a historian and my grandfather wrote home almost every day while he was deployed in France for three years. And my grandfather, um, and my father talked about the war a lot. And when my, I think partly because my father became a historian, he kept all the letters. Like my, my grandfather gave them to him and said like, I don't know what to do with these. What do you want to do with them? <laughs> and so my dad had them. And since I'm a French historian, I became really interested in what my grandpa's experience was like in France. And I managed to get my dad to give me all the letters. <laughs> There's probably about 600 of them. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, and so I had the really good fortune of having two amazing students this summer, Michaela Swanson and Emily Tyndall, work with me on the letters. So they did the transcribing of the letters using Tropy, and then they used Tropy to tag the letters to find certain things that my grandpa was always talking about oh. to kind of build a quantitative uh, engine in order to find patterns and eventually hopefully be able to trace his movements as he moved across England and then across France. So, so how did you become interested in digital humanities? Yeah, um, so I did, I taught a class at um, OU before I finished my um, PhD. I, I taught a class called Religion in Europe and I think that because I work, I used to work in museums before I even went back and got my PhD. So I think working in museums made me really interested in, in visualization tools and how often, I mean, I would argue pedagogically, you can deliver a lesson in a visual me in visual means that is, can be more effective than, you know, just reading it aloud or reading it in, in a book. I believe that but that's, you know, one of the reasons I worked in museums and I think that's part of the reason then when why I was open to digital humanities um is because we, we we did do a lot of it in the museum field um yeah. and I always found it to to reveal to really reveal new ways of thinking um yeah. that I just didn't feel like I could get in other in other means. Um, so that was kind of like, I, I was interested because I like to learn. That's a, one way I like to learn. Now teaching it is, was difficult because I am, as Megan will tell you, I am not <laughs> extremely intuitive about anything digital. Um, I kind of know <laughs> what, I, I have some ideas about what I think would be really effective or, um, you know, revelatory, but I don't know how to get there. And so one thing I will just say, this is kind of like a plug for DH at most universities, but um, at OU, when I taught that class on religion and then here at OSU, I have unfailingly found nothing but amazing guidance from the DH librarians. They're just incredible. Um, and so, yeah, so that's kind of the long and the short of it. Um, 
And I'll just add that I come at DH from wanting to approach it both from a researcher's perspective of how can I use DH to manipulate my data so that I discover things, that there are synergies that I wouldn't necessarily come to with my own brain. <laughs> um, <laughs> And then from a teaching perspective and, you know, someone who believes strongly in public history too, I find it to be a really cool pedagogical and an outreach tool for history. Yeah. <laughs> I know a lot of scholars really struggle to define digital humanities. And so this is a two part question. How do you define digital humanities? And then it's also really hard to explain to people who are new in DH. So how did you explain that to um, the two girls that you worked with this summer? Oh, yeah. Let's see. Um, I think of digital humanities, it might actually be a fairly conventional definition, but I think of digital humanities is, um, is any kind of work that uses the tools of computing on some level to reveal new questions and new answers about the human experience. And for me, that's history. Um, but so for me, it's really the method, you know, the, the, the revelatory process that DH provides um, that, as I said, like the computer brain can kind of do that I don't, that I can't, um, or, you know, the visualization is something that I simply can't describe with my words. Um, for my students, for my students this summer, I explained it in actually just the same terms. I said, you know, I've got 600 letters that my grandpa wrote. There's no human way possible that I can actually make sense of 600 letters if I don't have some help. And so I need your help, but I also need digital humanities help because with this amount of material, I want something auxiliary to help me synthesize it and find patterns. So how do you think digital humanities has made your project really exciting and really, how is it different than doing, using traditional historical methods? Yeah, well, um, so, so, you know, right now we're at this kind of like, it's not, it's not doing anything flashy, right? Because I'm using Tropy and Tropy is very much a, really a, a, class, a categorizing, uh, classifying, um, you know, a tool that makes it helpful to make sure all the research is getting logged correctly. And so this is like setting the, you know, the foundation. Um, so it's not flashy, but I mean, I don't think that I would have, you know, for one, been able to see all these patterns that in terms of for what my grandfather writes about all the time, if, you know, we hadn't used this, um, a platform like Tropy, which is just, it's a very intuitive platform. And so, you know, you can at once see the, um, the kind of basic, you know, metadata um, for what you, what it is, and then on the same screen, you can see the image of the letter. In my cases, you know, it's letters from my grandfather, and then the transcription. Of, um, and then you can also see the tags that my students tagged for it. And so, you know, I mean, like I said, it's not flashy, but it's, a, it's really satisfying as a researcher to be able to have all of that information in front of you. Um, and it feels very clean. It feels very organized. It feels like, um, you know, an organized brain, basically. Yeah. Which is, it's comforting when you're researching and using a lot of sources. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'm unconvinced that I would be able to have that level of organization and see those patterns if I was doing yeah. this with like a series of Word documents. That just, yeah. the visualization wouldn't be possible. Um, the other thing I'll just say is that... Um, one thing I think is neat about digital humanities is that I think it often involves more than one person doing the work. In my case, there's been four people involved in that. I'm sure there'll be more. Um, and that's been exciting because um, for most historians, it's solo work in the archive. And I really have enjoyed working with my students on the project and, and seeing how it's fun, been fun to watch how their brains work as they do archival work and to see how they tag things. Um, 
Yeah, I really, and you know, like that we can, we're basically screen sharing. Um, yeah. And I really enjoyed that. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, those were probably, you know, the kind of digital aspects um, that I don't think I would find in a normal project. Yeah. Do you want to show us um, some yeah. of the screenshots you've taken of your project? Sure. Yeah. So, so this is what Trophy looks like once it's been filled out quite a bit. So um, this is, you know, when I was saying that you can kind of see everything um, when you're working. So this isn't actually quite the screen I had in mind, but you can also still see that there's, there's a lot that you can see at once. Um, yeah. which, and I think it's helpful when you're dealing with a big data set. So here, um, so this is, you know, Grizzle correspondence is what all of the letters are being saved under. This is, I forget what it's called, but this is basically the trophy group. Mm -hmm. And then we imported the photos of the, the scans of letters that were sent in that I did the scans and then Megan Mackin helped me upload them into trophy and they're organized in these folders by their date, but then they're also just, you know, individually listed here. And so my students did this, you know, they, you've got the letter, the, the letters being sent sequentially um, with the date that they were sent. And they were all sent by my grandfather, Bob Griswold. Um, yeah. And then you can kind of start to see the um, tags that they've created. Okay. Um, so you can see that my grandfather <laughs> talked about air raids, alcohol, <laughs> um, a lot about the arrival of gifts. I've seen, you know, we learned by just looking, so far we've, we've gone through 75. We learned that gifts were something that the men really worried about, you know, gifts yeah. from home. Um, baseball, all these ants that I'd never heard of. So that's kind of fun. <laughs> so I'll go, let me, I'm going to kind of zoom in. So, so this is what it looks like if you pick, if you go to one specific letter and, um, Tropy is really um, intuitive because, you know, I can't really show you guys this, but basically you can very easily enlarge the letter. Um, so what we have here is that this is what the scan looks like of the original document. And then this is a um, transcription that my student did. Um, in this letter, my grandfather is talking, to, he's writing to my grandma and he's talking about their daughter Sally who I think was two at the time she was actually born when he was deployed um, and he says gee she's chubby and cute I think she looks like a little Dutch girl <laughs> it goes on um, so I went, yeah my grandfather was it was quite a character and um, there's other letters that are much weirder um, he says I hope she's as pretty as her mom when she grows up which I guess is a nice thing to say um, and then this is I just thought I would kind of show I, I zoomed in and this is what the um, the letter looks like itself and so this is a email that was sent the the, um, the US government realized I think within like the first year of the war that they were sending home way too much mail in mailbags. It was taking um, just, you know, up way too much room on ships. And so they came up with this process of photographing the letters um, on site in Europe, squeezing them down onto film, sending them back to the U.S., where they then got blown up again and to, you know, a letter size of about this big. And then they were transferred on to the to the recipient um oh, fascinating <laughs> yeah yeah it's cool like females females actually a story in its in its own right um yeah yeah um and then the last thing I, i'll show so this is not um trophy but i <laughs> it has nothing to do with world war ii um but th this is um a map um that is created using um omeka which is another digital humanities platform that I think we're going to probably use when we get around to moving from this, the tropey part of the project, which is really the research organization, um, to the actual visualization and kind of public presentation. And what I want is, I mean, of many things, what I want to do is, is to be able to, to map out his travels. Um, and I'm also really interested in, in trying to use DH to find patterns, even if they're really boring, because I think one thing I found by doing this work with my students is that 
for some, the war was really boring. Um, <laughs> you know, for dentists, <laughs> the yeah. war didn't really get hot ever. Um, it didn't yeah. mean it wasn't hard. And so he, you know, writes very frequently about the mud and about flies in the beer and the behavior of the locals. And so we're going to try to not just plot that on a map, but also use other platforms to create kind of visualizations of like what, when does he, can we, can we create a, a visualization of what time of year he's most commonly complaining about the weather, for example, that kind of, <laughs> that kind of question, which, yeah. yeah, which is something that DH makes a lot easier. It's to do that, to do that kind of work on my own would probably take me 10 times as long as, yeah as DH. Yeah. So, yeah. So how did yeah. you come up with the idea for this project? My grandfather, you know, well, I did my master's work um, in, I did an MA in museum studies a long time ago and I worked on the DJ, yeah. on D-Day and the, the D-Day museums that were set up. And so I spent a lot of time driving around Normandy. And I think that it's really from that I wanted to I wanted to try to figure out where my grandfather had been in Normandy and to a certain extent it was kind of a mystery because you know he can't say where he is in his letters and I was hoping that I might be able to find enough facts from the letter and then maybe you know DH would reveal to me his true yeah. whereabouts and then the end I don't think that that's going to be possible like I don't think that DH can you know I can plug in stuff and it will be like surprise this was his route. I mean, there's <laughs> limits, right? Yeah. But I think that's what it came from, is just having these questions about his experience and knowing that there were 600 letters and putting those two together and being like, how can I get meaningful data out of this? Thank you so much for interviewing me today. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. This has been Exploring Digital Humanities at the OSU Library, and we hope that you'll join us next time. Bye.